Hi, Mickey. Hey, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing fine. I was worried about you. Yeah, well, I'm I, back from Saudi Arabia where I, I was brainwashed, and uh, my friends and family are, have done their best to deprogram me. Uh, and we will find out in the second half of this dialogue when we discuss Saudi Arabia whether they have uh, successfully pried me away from the beliefs I expressed in the previous dialogue, we, which many of our commenters uh, considered uh, unjustifiably rosy. We really should have called it the hostage tape edition. I mean, so I, many of them so many of them thought, yeah. Uh, or the Stockholm Syndrome edition. I think a meeting with Marty Parrots and Steve Emerson is in order, no? Uh, yeah, I think that would do it. I, I think I should get them together for a dialogue with uh, some Saudis. Uh, um, well, we'll get speaking of which, speaking of which, you know, there's a, a, I, I, after talking to you, after I had been through this series of, you know, government ministries and, and gotten their propaganda and everything, I talked to a, a number of kind of non-governmental people, including a couple of bloggers, and it looks like maybe we'll get a couple of them on blogging heads, possibly. Uh, Saudi bloggers. Saudi bloggers. What could be more exciting? <laughs> uh, do they have do they have minders or can they blog freely at risk of going to prison? Uh, I think there are some things they would be reluctant to talk about. Okay. Um, um, we'll get to that. Yeah, we'll get to that. Um, uh, but first, we wanted to talk about uh, the issue of the day. The well, the issue of the week. In fact, I'm not sure there's anything left to say about it. But of course, we refer to Bittergate, Barack Obama. But don't call it Bittergate, as as many bloggers, have, uh, as many people have pointed out. Uh, when Barack Obama made those controversial comments in San Francisco, uh, saying that people people in small towns in Pennsylvania were bitter was was the least of it. I mean, that's the most defensible part of it. He also said, "Well, they cling to their." religion and to guns and to uh, racism and to xenophobia uh, because it's the only thing that explains their frustration at the declining economy. Uh, and there were sort of so many things uh, wrong with that that it was almost hard to, to catalog all of them. Uh, he was like, go ahead. But I've, I've got to think you didn't really bemoan this fact. I mean, it's kind of uh, when there's negative news about Barack Obama, you're feeling good, right? Not really. I mean, I would love. To, I'm probably going to end up voting for him, as are you. And it, it, it would be nice to think that that, that, that he's going to be great. Uh, and well, also, me... it would be nice to think he's going to win. But, but he hasn't been nominated yet, and you want to find out what makes this guy tick. And he seems stuck in a time warp. Uh, he's spouting. Uh, I mean, I remember spouting that false consciousness jargon in the dining hall of my dorm cafeteria explaining, well, these people aren't really racist, it's just that they're frustrated their economic s situation in 1972. And mm -hmm. it was, it was you know, all too convenient back then. Wow. Uh, so you joined the... William Crystal, in a somewhat different sense, accused him of, of, of uh, revealing himself to be a Marxist with these comments. Well, you, you, in a somewhat different sense, are making that claim? Well, of course it's a Marxist comment. He's saying that the economy trumps the superstructure of ideology, guns, and religion, uh, and, yeah, but and that's, culture. Yeah, but that's... And that's it, Marxist in a very broad sense, in which actually many, many people are Marxist well, right, without but knowing it. But there are many people who aren't Marxist, and it's, it, it's, it's crude, vulgar Marxism. It's economic determinism. Uh, but I'm one of them. I and, resent that. And so are you, Bob. I resent uh, that. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it, it, it's kind of my worldview that, that material circumstances uh, do a lot to shape our beliefs. Well, that's, but, I mean, Crystal, Crystal was focusing on the, you know, religion is the opiate of the masses part of Marxism. Did you read Crystal's column? I read Crystal's column. It was, it was, it was. He was right about the Marxism part, but it had, it had the, um, it had the air of a sort of uh, smug hatchet job. Uh, yeah, well, so some of his, a certain number of Crystal's columns do have the uh, air of uh, a hack propagandist at work. I must say, uh, but um, the, I mean, the opiate of the masses thing is, is, is. He wasn't really saying it was the opiate of the masses, although there is a strain of commentary that says. Black liberation churches don't really respect the white church, and he was talking about white Pennsylvania's churches. So he really might, it might not be completely an accident that he lumped it in with racism and xenophobia. Mm -hmm. uh, he tried to later say, "Oh, he meant cling to it in a, in a good way." 
Mm-hmm. Uh, anyway, it should be it should be called Klinggate, not Bittergate, because the Kling well, why are, uh, the why? Kling part. Is okay, Klinggate. Okay, Klinggate. Um, but why are you um, so intent on dwelling on this kind of obscurely Marxist aspect? Because as I said, tons of people believe this that that, that economic. And, and you know, and other material factors shape our beliefs. What what is so scandalous about no, that no, I, per se? I, 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 I really is, don't get that. And this is where I have an actual genuine conundrum that I turn to you for guidance on, Bob. I'm always suppose, here to as help. As opposed Mickey. to argument. Um, it, uh, a I, first, I'm concerned that it was condescending because I think the purpose of liberalism should be to ensure social equality, and being condescending is the opposite of social equality. It's looking down on people, and all liberals have to offer it seems to me, is a society where nobody looks down on anybody. We can't, given the state of the economy, you know, Obama's not going to be able to deliver in the wonderful economic miracle that's going to restore low-skilled, very high-paying industrial jobs to the Midwest. He's not going to deliver on that promise. What liberals can't, okay, but wait, what on liberals the, on can't the condescension. deliver on is social equality, so that's why I care about it, okay? The, but but on, the, on the condescension, are you saying that I mean, is this the connection with, with the so-called Marxism that to explain, to say that you know more than other people do about the material circumstances shaping their beliefs Wait. is intrinsically condescending? Is that the thing? I, I think so. This is where I, I need guidance. I mean, I, 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 am, I, I believe in vulgar Marxism in the world stage, okay? I, I think that you, you can go to the Arabs and Chinese and say, look, Event, your material circumstances eventually are going to require democracy and liberalization, and they re- require a non-viciously uh, jihadist version of Islam. They're going to require an Islamic reformation. You may not know that, but I know it. I'm for modernity. I think eventually you will change and become more like me. That is the same thing Obama was saying to these Pennsylvanians. He's saying, look, I know that if I bring an economic revitalization to your region, you're going to stop clinging to guns and God and religion and, 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 and anti-immigrant sentiment and racism. And I know this. You're, I know that you'll change. It seems to me that is sort of inherently condescending in the Obama case because you're saying, you know, you may think you're for guns and religion, but I'm not going to respect that. I'm going to say that's just what you think and you'll change. And why is it equally condescending toward the Arabs? We're saying, look, you, you may think, uh, you know, we're infidels and you may believe in this pure version of Islam, but I know that's bogus and, it's, you know, as, as soon as you get a whiff of modernity and prosperity, you're going to be watching Britney Spears' videos and, and that's all going to go kablooey. Uh, it, it seems to me they're both condescending. And, and that, since I believe in the second, uh, uh, I'm condescending too. Well, first of all, this strikes me as really an extremely obscure concern. <laughs> I mean, of all the questions you can ask that are raised by what Obama did, like, what is it? What, does this mean he would be a serious screw up as a president? Because it was arguably a serious screw up, you know. Does it mean A? Does it mean B? For you to worry that, you know, <laughs> that, that it's that all all various forms of explaining people's behavior are actually kind of subtly condescending that's a pretty oblique takeaway well, but anyway that, that's obama's uh, that's obama's modus operandi is to explain everything to everybody else well so that's, he's going to that's be doing for, a lot of it as president and if it's condescending that's going to be a problem but that's the mo also of things like all of social science are all social scientists condescending because they they try to find factors that explain people's behavior which are almost certainly factors that the people themselves are not entirely aware of good question uh, that's it's it's you know I mean we all do this all the time really so so but it's it's rare to have a politician do it and that's one of the reasons Obama is supposed to be so magnificent and nuanced and sophisticated is because he does it Okay, right. well, maybe, no, there's, I mean, a reason. The maybe comments, there's a reason why they don't do it. It's because it pisses people off and it's condescending and it's we don't want our leaders doing that. The comments obviously had an air of condescension. Leaving aside the much larger question you're asking about the extent to which condescension is intrinsic in various forms of explanation, you know, that it was... I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you my reaction. I mean, I mean, the loophole you could find, by the way, if you're... If you're concerned uh, about being condescending by virtue of just trying to explain people's behavior, you could always argue that that people in general are, in a way, in a better position to analyze the behavior of others than they are of their own of, of their own behavior, right? Because our own motivations are kind of systematically uh, concealed from us. You might argue by by 
this is a legacy of natural selection. So you can always say, you know, just as I'm, I'm in a better position to, to analyze the people of Kansas objectively, they're in a better position to analyze me objectively. You could get out of it with that loophole if that will make you sleep better at night. Mickey, I, bet, will that help? I bet Obama wouldn't like it if the people of Kansas psychoanalyzed him, as, as many pundits have. I, I mean, one of the problems, the loophole is, sort of, is, is fortuitous because one of the problems is Obama never applies his analysis to himself. In other words, well, he's anyway, just I mean, but, but yes, I mean, I, 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 I don't, so I don't, I, I'm not, I don't know, I, I condescend to you, so you go ahead and condescend to me. I mean, I don't think that's what Obama's saying. Well, look, it, they definitely had an air of condescension. I mean, I'll tell you my series of of reactions to the thing. I was in uh, Saudi Arabia when I first read about this. My first reaction was, I cannot believe he said something that stupid. Just could not believe it. I mean, the idea of a politician saying, you know, with, with, in any kind of derogatory way that Americans, that any group of Americans are clinging to religion, right? I mean, that's just like, you know, that's high on the list of things politicians aren't supposed to say in America. Now, as I learned more about it, uh, I, I see, I was imagining him saying it like, at a, you know, with the cameras rolling, like at a press conference or something. Uh it became apparent that actually he said it in a quasi-private environment and, uh, and, and, you know, probably did not have the expectation of it being reported. Now, if that's the case, then he made at least one mistake right, which, which is these days you should never assume, you know, you're off the record unless you are in, in a... In a Soundproof booth I mean, with a couple of people you trust really well, right? I mean, I mean, I mean but that's such a, the world is just transparent. But it, and, that and isn't a if new, he didn't know that before, he knows it, it now. It isn't a new thing for a politician to, to expect anything he says at a fundraiser with a large group of people to be reported. I mean, that's that's like a, a ten years ago insight he should have had. So the outrage, the outrage that uh, oh they reported this, it, it it just reflects badly on him. I mean, that's like Ezra Klein twittering and talking about doing obscenities to Tim Russert and saying, oh, well, I didn't know that was public. Everybody knows it's public. Uh, the, uh, hey, you know, you should do a dialogue with Ezra Klein sometime. I just thought I'd get in a gratuitous Ezra Klein swipe because I know that brings in the ratings. Yeah, and I know uh, I know we don't have to worry about you giving him equal time either. Well, he can, take a, swipe, the, um, he can take a swipe at me, but the, the, um, the you know, that, that makes it worse because he's saying, okay, it's just between our friends. Now I can tell you what I really think. So, look, this is what he really thinks. It makes it even stupider. This definitely reflects badly on his judgment in some sense or another. And he, he, the conclusion I came uh, to, I will, I will reveal by, by resuming my narrative, is, the, is yes. the how I, I... Okay, so so once... I was still puzzled. I thought, okay, so he made the mistake of thinking a quasi-private thing was off the record. Big mistake, okay, for starters. B, I'm still puzzled by the language. I don't, I don't understand... Uh, it, it seems... Inherently and obviously condescending, uh, not not just I mean just just, just totally off key, not the way you want to talk about Middle can, America. Can I and by the way, by the way, in that sense, it's reminiscent of, of, of Hillary's chocolate chip cookie remark in 1991 or two, right? When she said, "I'm not going to stay at home and bake chocolate chip cookies for my husband," not realizing that actually many women do that and don't right. think it's a bad thing and may want to vote. Right. You know? Can I can, it I, was, can I explain? It was, can I explain? My, my, What's that? Let me explain why he might have said that. I don't think it's that he was like saying, "Okay, we know all these people are hicks." Well, uh, I div I finally came up with a theory myself. But okay, if you well, want to go first, well, okay. My theory. My brother was at this event, as was his buddy David Coleman, and Coleman. Wow. Coleman blogged about it on Huffington Post, a pretty good blog. And the context was, people asked, "I'm for you, Barack. I want to go to." Pennsylvania and campaign, what tips do you have for me? So he was giving tips to, you know, San Francisco liberals about how to campaign in Pennsylvania. So he mm -hmm. was saying, when you encounter the locals, you'll find they have these quaint beliefs in guns and God that they cling to. Don't be put off by that. And that's the mm -hmm. context. Okay. Well, that that helps a little. I mean, the, uh, the, the other, the kind of Eye opener for me was this Charlie Rose video which you saw, where four years ago he had said something very similar, but in a much more positive light. Right? It, it, I mean, he had, he he had said, you know, when when our economic times are bad, 
you know, naturally you're going to want to go hunting with your with your with your buddies, you know, and 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 sustain the intergenerational tradition of hunting, and so too with religion. You want to go to church and sustain the, you know, help consolidate your identity and your social bonds and everything. It was kind of it was kind of all inoffensive. But, well, so it was. He, I mean, he was very, and he was very aware of the possibility that it would be condescending. But right. It was, well, but, but it was exactly. still condescending. I mean, I think, it was still condescending. Well, maybe, but it wasn't. It, it wasn't something. If he put it that way, we wouldn't be talking about it now, Mickey. Correct. It's, it was a huge difference. It, it also, the way he said it on the Charlie correct. Rose okay, show and the way he said it at this, resume at this your, fundraiser. Resume your narrative. Sorry. Don't okay. Me anyway. And that it's was in response to his the, uh, the the question of how does he what does he make of the what's the matter with Kansas thesis why do people vote against their economic interests and and vote so much on values and guns and things right. like that you know um, so uh, so so what I finally decided is this I mean you know politicians are like uh, you know jukeboxes I mean they have a, a, an answer for particular categories of questions. And the the you know you put in a nickel and press you know the, the the what's the matter with Kansas question, and the and the standard answer they've been giving for the last five years comes out, and I just think you know the question whatever question he was answering kind of triggered the what's the matter with Kansas riff of his, and something about being in a quasi private uh, environment led him to just phrase it in this kind of. Uh, you know, clipped, very concise and insufficiently subtle way, as if he didn't have to really worry about the implications of, of his expression. You know, well, um, yeah, but I think I think there's, there's 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 problems with even the benign 2004 Charlie Rose expression of the what's the matter with Kansas dogma. And obviously, there's some truth to it. Okay, there's a little bit of truth to it. But first, it's mighty convenient. Okay, it's it's saying oh. You know, there's nothing to these people's belief in guns or opposition to abortion or welfare was the classic example or affirmative action. It, it you know, we don't have to. It's just that they have this false consciousness that uh, that th their economic circumstances have made them cling to these old values. But they're they're really not right. And once we get uh, good jobs and good wages, they'll change and come around to our point of view. Well, in welfare, that was completely wrong. It was the classic apology of. Welfare is just a, just a scapegoat from economic hard times. No, people cared about welfare because they cared about welfare because they thought welfare was a bad thing. They cared about in, that in good times and bad times, and they were right about it. So that's the opposite of the what's the matter with Kansas. So which remind is the, me, the you, were in favor, you were in favor oh, okay, of welfare Bob, reform, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, this is very hilarious. The, the, um, the, uh, the, the opposite is, you know, the continuity is greater than the ups and downs. It's not that they intensified their lack of hunting or their faith in religion during bad times. They've always believed in hunting, in good times and bad times. They've always, uh, you know, been religious. And what's more, there might be something to their point of view, independent of a reaction to their straightened economic circumstances. Maybe there, maybe there's something. Maybe there's a, a germ of truth to their position on abortion. Maybe there's a germ of truth to their position on guns. Maybe there's a huge germ of truth to their opposition to affirmative action and to what they perceive as the standard mode of advancement of black politicians in America. Uh, so you know, it, it's uh, it's it's more wrong than it's right. The third thing is what you know. He, his, his theory is. Well, you know, if once I come, you know, once the Democrats offer them this great economic idea, you know, this this incredibly advantageous economic platform, they'll they'll come to our point of view. What's his great economic platform? A, a, a greater taxes on the rich? They're going to say, well, you know, I believe in deeply in my God and in guns and I in opposition to abortion. But hey, he's going to cut the taxes of the rich ten percent, so I'll go vote for the Democrats. I mean, he's not going to be able to restore. The lost industries of, of Pennsylvania, and if you know that's his platform, he's cruising for a huge bruising, even if he's elected. Well, your heartfelt desire to say negative things about Barack Obama at all costs once again manifests itself. See, Mickey. Bob, I come to you for guidance, and you try to turn it into a mindless sparring match. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just disgusted. Guidance doesn't bring traffic, Mickey. Well, sure Although, you know who's big in uh, Saudi Arabia is Dr. Phil, but that's a tangent. I'm sure that's what you told the investors. Mickey, Mickey will try to start a, to, to, a, a subtle probing and thicky through of problems, but I'm going to turn it into a mindless uh, crossfire imitation. Slugfest. Yeah. Slugfest. Yeah. Um, 
Well, it just seems to me that, again, you're on this kind of, you're picking up on this kind of obscure aspect of the whole controversy, which is whether, if we accept the benign version of what he was trying to say, whether that's right or wrong. Well, that's kind of interesting in an academic way. It's just not what this is about. It's, I mean, not, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's not academic. It's we're trying to figure out what he really thinks. The fact that he okay, said it fine, in 2004 but, but, but see, the reason shows that it's probably what he really thinks. So let's figure out what that is. Well, first of all, i got to say, I'm actually puzzled by all the commentary that sees this as an opportunity to kind of fathom his true beliefs. I mean, that was the premise of the Bill Crystal column. Ah, so the mask is off. This is what Obama really believes. Why would you ever take anything any politician says as a reflection of what they actually believe? And I'm being serious. I mean, politicians, and all of us are really, I think people in general are like this more than we admit, but politicians just say things that they think people want to hear. That's their job. It's, it's well, what I, they do. I think, I think he may be a little bit of a different kind of politician in that respect. Well, I'm glad and, to hear you say something positive and, about and, him. And, but and, and also, the, the premise is if you hear somebody over and over again, even though they're trying to tell you what you want to hear, eventually you figure out what, what they think. And if you want to try to predict what they're going to do in the future, which is what voters have to do, you sort of got to go through that exercise. I mean, it's pretty clear how John McCain thinks. you got a pretty good idea uh, that he hasn't thought a hell of a lot about the economy, for example. Uh, right. If you hear him talk. And, and you, can, you can see, you know, that Obama is, is some blogger, I think Jonah Goldberg put it, he's stuck in a time warp. He hasn't learned the lessons of the 90s, which is the, the Clinton welfare free trade lesson. He's, that's when he grew up. So it's like me in the 60s, him in the 90s, in, 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 in the 80s. So mm -hmm. we're electing a guy who hasn't realized what Bill Clinton has achieved. It's, o it's only doubly reinforces that, that he's running against Bill Clinton's wife. Uh, well, all I'm saying is you could have made this critique a week before he said this. If you want to get into the substance of his well-known views on the economy, fine. It's just, it's just a weird thing to try to kind of ins For me, the big question is why the hell did he say something so weird? Does it reflect... Uh, does the weirdness of it, you know, yeah. the, the total off-keyness of it reflect badly on his ability to be a good president? I, I, th that's, to me, the interesting question. The, 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 the argument you want to have, you could have two weeks ago, three weeks ago, you can have it in a month. Because well, his position papers are out there. Well, we didn't quite know that he was just pandering to anti-trade sentiment because these people are just clinging, they're just roofs clinging to trade. Now we sort of... Well, wait, wait a second. We still don't know that, Mickey. That's Mickey. Know, we still don't another, know that. But it's another bit Mickey's of, pandering. A, he's pandering to anti-free trade sentiment because he thinks that will get him elected, and that was also evident two weeks ago. Well, he it thinks it will get him nominated. Was it, more specifically, was it evident, or do we not know it? You, you just said two. Well, ever three since things. he turned on NAFTA, it's. It, I mean, ever since. The, I mean, the whole for weeks and weeks and weeks, it's been clear that he and Hillary both thought that they needed to position themselves against free trade to get the nomination. Well, this adds this no is, new information, well, sure, and any information you're, you're claiming that it adds is premised well, on this extremely naive idea well, sure, that what politicians say reflects what they believe. Well, he's running as a new kind of politician, and to some extent he is. So, And also, I, I actually don't know to what extent he's cynical about trade. I mean, I know what Austin Goolsby thinks. But, uh, no, I don't, I don't mean he's I, really I cynical know, about I, trade. I, I didn't know that... I didn't know that this was just boob bait for the Bubba's and he's going to pursue a sensible free trade policy. I find that reassuring, actually. But it's good to know. It's another bit of evidence. But anyway, the, my point is... I think this I, brings no new information to the question of what he'll I, really do about free trade. I care about it because I think the whole purpose of liberalism in the Democratic Party is to ensure social equality. And if you have a president who's not a social egalitarian, that's a problem, I think. Not a huge problem. He's maybe. not a social egalitarian? A person who thinks he's like you know lecturing everybody and is above everybody as this sort of Archimedean point against which all other viewpoints could be measured, but he's the one who's right. That could be a, that could be and if, that could be a problem. I'd like to know that. I mean, I just think we're all implicitly elitist in that way. We all assert these views that are sometimes not widely held, and the premise is that we're more enlightened than other people. Well, and, and I just think. The, the idea that that means he is not in favor of social equality and would not be as a practical matter as, as president is, I think, uh, you know, a little well, bit crazy. Yeah, well, you know, I saw this item from your blog from like a couple of weeks ago that may shed some light on the position you're taking. It was just, it said, two memes running, colon. I'll try to keep track of the two most underdeveloped negative memes on Obama. He's a wuss and he's arrogant. Now, 
the idea that it's your mission to try to give more life to 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 negative memes about Obama if they're not sufficiently developed, where I think by your definition, devel full development means they totally overwhelm the blogosphere and doom his chances of uh, being nominated or elected. I, 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 I do think you kind of try to find the negative um, when it comes to well, Obama. I was, one, I, I was trying to, like, you know, give names to things and put things in useful categories so one can mm. think about them. Mm. Uh, I, like I say, we're gonna, both going to end up voting for Obama. The quite... He, he, it's just that, Bob, that one of us is on a quest for the truth and the other is on a quest for cheap, short-term partisan advantage. Uh, and the one on the quest for the truth would be me? Um, I think that's wrong. But uh, oh. here's, here's, here's a perfect segue, okay? I think it's a yeah. good segue. I mean, when you go to a country like Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia, is there any chance that the House of Saud, if it pursues this, this these modernization uh, uh, and liberalization plans that it has. It is successful at it, even if it doesn't include a free inquiry component, okay? Even if it doesn't include, like, liberalism in the classic, pure sense, if it's just mm -hmm. people learn a whole lot and develop, is there any, any chance that if what you, if it develops as you want, the House of Saud will still be a, a th will still be ruling Saudi Arabia in a hundred years? No. So your attitude to the House of Saud is, yeah, you go ahead and do things, and by the way, I secretly think you're like completely screwing yourself because you're going to be out of power in 100 years. But hey, it's a good thing. You should go ahead and do it. And and, and you're, you're such a fool, but go ahead and do it. Your same attitude toward the Chinese. Hey, you communist rulers, let's have commercialization. Of course, it's going to end up in your downfall because you're not going to be able to control it. But hey, that's your problem if you can't figure that out. Uh, your attitude toward the Saudis and the Chinese is inherently condescending. And I bet they pick up on it, Bob. Well, first of all, I just said all of us do this kind of thing, that is implicitly condescending or elitist. I, 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 I fessed up to this tendency long ago, and I think pretty much everybody, you know, who, who in the chattering class and beyond is guilty of it. So that's, uh, this is not a news flash to me. I mean, in the case of Saudi Arabia, I actually think that uh, King Abdullah may actually imagine that in a hundred years ago his great-great-great-grandkids won't have a throne to sit on, and, and he's fine with that because it would be in the interest... Uh, where he's going is in the interests of, you know, the Saudis, including actually his kin probably for the next 10, 20, 30 years. I don't know. And, and I, should, I should say one of the several uh, asterisks I would add to what I said last time is that uh, he, he is the sponsor of the reforms I'm talking about, or many of them, and there's some concern over there that his heir apparent who apparently is pretty well specified at this point, will not, there's reason to believe that his heir apparent will not be nearly uh, as liberal in his inclinations. And so there's some concern over that, and that's one of many things that could derail this. But it's true that I did make the claim while over there that I saw, um, you know, saw that, that, that there were forces had been set in motion that were uh, powerfully bringing uh, modernization and liberalization to Saudi Arabia, although, of course, those are both relative terms. I wasn't saying Saudi Arabia will be America in 20 years, but still, that considerable liberalization was seemed to be on its way if the backlash uh, from fundamentalists could be avoided. I, I, I did say that, and I also said that, uh, you know, the, the, the government was, uh, you know, was not sponsoring jihadism, on the contrary, was trying to suppress it. And in that and many other respects, its interests are basically aligned with America's. They want to check Iranian influence. They want to solve the Israel-Palestine problem. Uh, they have, you know, th that was my basic take on the thing, is that I came away uh, more upbeat than I had gone in. Now, since talking to you, as I said, I, I talked to some various kind of non-governmental types, a couple of bloggers, um, there was an American journalist who had been there a while, and she brought along her Saudi friend, uh, a woman, um, and we talked to her. Uh, I talked to uh, a, a, a guy who just finished graduate school, an aspiring scholar. I talked to a guy who, young guy who owns a bunch of private schools and is very proud of the fact that he's uh, instituting, uh, st that he has student body elections, which is like an innovation there, you know. Um, so I've talked to... I did talk to a number of... I, I talk, happened to run into a guy at the airport who's a consultant for the big, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, higher education initiative that, that King Abdullah is uh, sponsoring. He's uh, actually a former president of uh, Case Western University. 
And I got to say, after talking to all of this and, and having you know several people on the Blogging Head staff trying to convince me that I had drunk the Kool-Aid and, and really the, 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 the situation is much grimmer, and after reading the comments with a bunch of commenters saying they were sure that I would, uh, you know, once I, I, I got back in America, I would see the light, I got to say... I'm not retreating very far from my original position. How far do you there are some new, there's some nuance I would add, but I, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, add nuances. Well, there's the thing about, you know, uh, it all hinges on King Abdullah's, the spirit of his reforms yeah. being sustained and, and, and him not having a reactionary uh, successor. Uh, more, the, nu um, more nuances. We have that nuance. Well, the, um, you know, there's specific things I said that in further... Uh, I, I learned later were not as dramatic as I had thought. Like this, this idea of a co-ed. I said they were going to open a co-ed university in, however soon. Turns out that that's, it's this obscure like graduate level university in like nanotechnology, and I'm no longer sure in how robust a sense it's going to be co-educational. By the way, we visited a women's college too, private women's college, subsequent to, yeah. to my talk in Saudi Arabia, and talked to all these, uh, you right. know, female faculty members and administrators, right. which was very interesting. Um, um, uh, okay, that's another nuance. That one of your yeah, one of the showpiece reforms turns out to be not much. Yeah, the um, I mean, like I said, I'm not retreating a lot. What I would stress is that uh, I'm not saying that it's not in many ways a bad place. I mean, there's a tendency when you when you issue a, a kind of a positive report about a country like this, in any sense positive, that people come in and say. You're wrong. They torture prisoners, or you're wrong. They cut off people's heads, and that doesn't contradict anything I said. I, I didn't say it's a place I want to live. I thought you said. They I didn't, didn't say I they don't. You said you know, they didn't torture people. No, I said they denied it. Oh. I said the, the Interior right. Ministry denied it. Right. Here, but here, in our presence, okay. well, they didn't even deny that it happens. They claimed right. the, the kind of the claim we made about Abu Ghraib, which right. is uh, that you know it's these freelancers. Here's, but here's here's my problem, which is. Uh, you know, King Abdullah wants to modernize. You claim they're sincere about modernizing. He lives in an authoritarian society. Well, why hasn't it happened? What are the forces arrayed against him? I get no sense from you who the enemies of modernization are and how strong they are. And, you know, if if you talked about them, maybe it would become clear that they're going to win. Who are they? Who, who's against all these Well, first things? of all, you said, why hasn't any of this liberalization um well, we've been happened. I mean, the kinds of things that are going to drive it are manifestly happening. I mean, broadband access is is growing with the government support. And, and as I said last time, everyone agrees that the Internet has opened up the realm of freedom of expression. Not nearly to American levels, but have opened it up. Um, you know, number of women in higher education, female literacy rate. By the way, oh, come on, one of our uh, commenters, one of our precious few female commenters, uh, came up with the stats on that. And in terms of the increase in female literacy between, like, 92 and 04, but, I think, was from something but, like 78% to 91%. Again, so all these forces are in motion. Uh, uh, and Again, you're talking about the good forces. Who are the bad forces? You're talking about all these great... Well, they are fundamentalists. And what's them? not okay, clear to me still... I, I mean, finally, who are they? What I mean, bureaucracy are they in? What are they doing to stop it? Okay, well, like, you know, people in Riyadh, uh, which is not the most cosmopolitan... You know, Saudi Arabia is like America, which is that the more cosmopolitan places are on the coast, naturally, more interaction with the rest of the world, the conservative places are in the middle. Riyadh is that's in the they, middle. That's where they cling to religion. Well, hey, Saudi Arabia clings to religion, period, man. I, it is amazing to see a place where so taken by... Religion and the, and that so structures its everyday life to the dictates of a very uh, so, ritually strict religion. I mean, they have the call to prayer five times a day. So you uh, and many 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 Saudis, uh, including one of the bloggers I hope to have on. You know, they get up at the for the right. very first one. So is there is when the sun comes up, and then and then the subsequent four one four are I think within business hours, and every shop closes. This is every day, okay? Right. Every shop closes for every call to right, prayer. Right, okay, but. But, but are you saying that there's a religious bureaucracy? Again, we're, I'm being like a Marxist materialist. Is there a religious bureaucracy whose interests are threatened by this modernization? And what leads us to um, think that the, the Saudi king, especially since his successor doesn't believe it, is going to succeed in beating this religious bureaucracy? When you ask people, like I said, Riyadh is in the conservative center, but Riyadh is relatively cosmopolitan compared to some nearby cities. When you ask people in Riyadh, they say, well, okay, north of us is this city that is the epicenter of fundamentalism, okay? So first of all, in places like that, 
the places like that are where you're going to get tend to get grassroots uh, resistance, po- uh, very possibly abetted by imams there at relatively conservative mosques. Now, the question of where the religious establishment in the sense of the government establishment sits, I'm, I'm, I'm not totally clear on it all. We sat down with these guys at the Ministry of Islamic Affairs. They're the ones who have the power to fire imams. Uh, I am told that they conducted a purge uh, of more than 100 imams uh, a few years ago, and they still fire them occasionally if they're found to espouse violence. If, if, they're, if they're accused of espousing violence in the mosque, there's an investigation, and I'm told these guys will can them. Uh, if indeed it turns out to be that that's what they did. But I can't say that I really feel confident of where... I mean, I like these guys. The, the, they seemed very earnest and sincere and very much wanting a moderate interpretation of Islam. But I can't say that I've investigated enough to know where the government religious establishment is exactly. I mean, you know, the stereotype is the government and the religious establishment does this deal where... You know, all of the princes can go drink and gamble and have sex, and the religious authorities won't say anything about it as long as the government nourishes this very conservative form of Islam. Right. Um, I don't. Uh, I don't know that that's not the case. Um, I, I suspect it's. A, I, I think first of all, the, the the princes are keeping a lower profile on this front than they used to. But um, oh, by the way, I should say though, Prince Prince Bandar seems to be sinking into a scandal that may seem to contradict some of what I'm saying, okay? Which is what? Well, I don't know how much of this is on the record yet, actually. I mean, it's this bribery scandal where he... um, Alleged. uh, Let's keep using the word alleged. uh, He wanted to... uh, The allegation is he wanted to land a huge amount of... uh, Some kind of huge kickback, this is the allegation, in exchange for steering um, fighter jet contracts to Britain or something like that, okay? And... And what I've heard, and I don't know if this has been reported, is that at one point when Britain started to investigate the alleged scandal, he said, hey, it would be a shame if we quit cooperating with you on intelligence, and so some more British subways got bombed. Now, I would just say that's not the same as a concerted government effort to export jihadism. That, if it's true, it would be a case of personal corruption and a guy using all the sleazy levers at his disposal. Yeah, that doesn't seem relevant to the large... World no, it doesn't. But I mean, but I can about. just see, I can just see commenters linking to this headline if, if it comes out. So anyway, um, he did, where was he I? Did I don't really know exactly did, where the religious establishment per se is. There's one other thing I would say though that 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 came to my attention is in terms of the government's motivation for sustaining a very strict form of Islam. Um, the uh, the it, it certainly goes beyond a kind of corrupt deal with, with the imams, which is that. I, I didn't realize until I went there how much of Saudi Arabia's kind of soft power within the Islamic world comes from the fact that they have the two holy mosques in Saudi Arabia. And that apparently leads them to want to to be, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, holier than the Pope, as they say. And that, that's one reason they are reluctant. They don't want to be able to be, I think, accused of being religious, you know, radical liberalizers, radical innovators, by kind of anyone, you know? I, I think that may be part of it as well. But at some point, won't the rest of the world be more liberal than they are, so they'll... That, that, that suggests that we have to liberalize the rest of the world before Saudi Arabia, because they're always going to be the last to switch, because they have control of Mecca. Well, they may be the last, but, but, but they're, they're lagging considerably behind immediate neighbors like Egypt right now. I mean, one of these bloggers said he was so shocked when he went to Egypt and saw, like, a man and a woman, a husband and wife, walk, just, just walking along the street together, like, holding hands or something. I mean, God, I haven't seen that in years. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, it doesn't happen around here. Maybe you're hanging around the wrong bars. Um, uh, I've forgotten my thought. Um... Well, I just, I mean, you know, I, I, like I said, I want to get these bloggers on and they can tell their, their own story and they don't necessarily agree with me about all this stuff at all. Um, but that's probably better than me making, uh, making these arguments. No. Um, my next question, what, my, I remember my thought. Uh, how scared are they of Iran and these so-called Shiite crescent? Well, they're scared to death of Iran. And it's interesting... The, 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 this business of them being, you know, the custodians of the holy mosques, and by the way, I mean, this is so much a part of their identity that 
If you read uh, the kind of official establishment press, like the Arab News, which comes out in English, um, you would think King Abdullah would be identified as King Abdullah. He is a king, after all. But no, the title they give him is the custodian of the two holy mosques. On first reference, that's the style rule in Saudi newspapers. I mean, it's really an important part um, of his identity. And the way this figures into the, the... The way this, in a way, puts them at a disadvantage with Iran is like... Iran, they are clearly involved in a bunch of stuff that involves killing other Muslims, right? I mean... The, 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 in Iraq, they're involved in stuff that, that, that helps Shiites kill Sunni Muslims. And they also seem to be involved, uh, if you buy a lot of explanations of what happened in Basra, uh, a lot of people think that they, they turned on al-Sadr and so were involved in having Shiite Muslims kill other Shiite Muslims. I can't figure so, if they turned on al-Sadr or if they fomented al-Sadr as their cat's paw. There's sort of two competing theories there. But anyway... No, there there are conflicting reports, but no one doubts that like they're not they're not afraid to weigh in and go you know mano a mano with other Muslims and be and be responsible for killing them. Saudi Arabia really doesn't want to be put in that position. Okay, I think you know it would be reluctant to even be in the position of fi fighting a Shiite country like Iran. So, and that's one reason that in Iraq, um, I think it's one reason that. What some people think is Iran's preferred outcome in Iraq, there's controversy about this too, but some people think that, that, that Iran would like to just split Iraq and, and more or less own the Shiite part, you know, break up the country, more or less own the Shiite part, have tremendous influence in the Kurdish part, and, and might be willing to leave the Sunni part as a sphere of influence for Saudi Arabia. Well, Saudi Arabia is not at all enthusiastic about that. And I think one reason is that inevitably sorting out the boundaries would involve a certain amount of either warfare or proxy warfare, where they're like, you know, pretty conspicuously involved in, you know, things that, that lead to the deaths of, of other Muslims. And I think it's, this isn't the only reason they're very wary of that scenario, but one, one reason is that so much of their identity is invested in being this, you know, the epicenter of Islam that, you know, spans all borders within Islam. And, and it's, really, it's really something they kind of take into I, account I thought they were strategically. I thought they were, that, you know, that doesn't seem enough to me to, to be terrified of, of, uh, of Iran, so you have a, you have a few skirmishes, and you you cut some sort of border, and maybe you concede it more if you're scared of the skirmishes. But I thought what they were worried about is more that they have a lot of Shiites in their population, and it's an actual divisive split that might split their own country. Well, there's a few and, things and those, I think, and those areas happen to be the oil producing areas. Well, I think first of all, Iran is just bigger, has more people, and uh, so could feel the larger army, especially given that you know. The Saudis in Saudi Arabia, thanks to the oil boom, you know, not many of them are doing the kind of working class labor from which you, you know, the, 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 they're not part of the working class workforce from, wh from which an army is traditionally recruited. Right, right, right. I mean, if Saudi Arabia had to suddenly expand its army, I'm not sure where it would turn, because there aren't many Saudis, I think, who would really consider being a soldier preferable to their current lifestyle. Right. So I, I think there's practical reasons they don't want to confront Iran. Also... Iran can stir up, you know, they can, it isn't just that they could win over the Saudi Shiites, it's that they up the ante in the kind of fundamentalism competition, you know. They, they can be a role model for Sunnis, uh, you know, Sunni jihadis as well. But um, Iran would be a role model for Sunni jihadis? Well, why is it? So, yeah, so, I you, think, I, so I you're think, admitting you know, that they are locked into a competition for who's more fundamentalist. That's not, doesn't right, sound like exactly. Good, doesn't sound like a good dynamic. No, and that's why Saudi Arabia wants to dampen their influence in all these trouble spots, in Lebanon, in, in uh, the occupied territory uh, in, in Palestine, you know. They want to they damp this stuff down because the more the pot boils, that, you know, that's just an opportunity for Iran. They don't buy into any of the, uh, well, in America, it's neocon thinking that uh, Iran itself might be uh, eventually, in, in uh, you know, that there's an upheaval in store in which the, it be becomes less of a religious state? And would, they, would that really assuage them if they're, if they're locked in a sort of balance of power duel, uh, regional balance of power duel, why, why would that necessarily solve their problem? I, why would it solve Saudi Arabia's yes. problem for Iran to become more secular or yes. something? 
Oh, I think if it, if it exerted a moderating influence on Iran's foreign policy, um, they'd take it. They'd be happy with that. Uh, they they don't care whether I don't think they care whether Iran is is theocratic or not. Well, you could still be secular and expansionist, and was Iran could still be secular and want effective control of Basra. Uh, they could. Well, they could. That would not make them so happy. Yeah. yeah well, anyway. Um, well, I think so. You're. I think you're partially deprogrammed. You th do I sound like it? Partially. I think well, you're you're obviously a you're you're a, a, a pathetic lamb for a junket. I mean, just you know, put you up for a trip and you'll and you're easily swayed. Now, admittedly, I some some sort of hardcore anti Saudis have been on this junket, and it's obviously powerful medicine because they came back saying, "Well, the Saudis are really sincere," but that was 20 years ago. Okay, and it, not not that much has changed. They have a co-ed grad school being planned, so it, it, it's I'm skeptical. I think you may have a, a ways to go. Well, well, let me let me let me say one more thing about the forces in motion. Uh, and this this became clearer when I talked to this guy in the airport, who's a consultant for uh, for, the, for for their, their their educational initiatives. What they're doing, I talked about these like six mega cities that they're building, and these are tied into these, uh, they're part of this initiative to attract research talent from uh, foreign universities, okay. They are, I mean, let me start from the other end. I mean, we would go to these universities and they would say, here are the new, pro we're putting all this money into this high-tech program and this high-tech program and we're starting a graduate school and this and this and this and I would say, but do you really have a tradition of entrepreneurship here. I mean, what are these people going to do for jobs when they get out of graduate school, you know? And they would say, well, we have a program that teaches entrepreneurship. And I, I'd say, well, yeah, but the climate, you know, is, is the structure of the Saudi economy conducive to entrepreneurship? You know, and I was skeptical. Now, what I heard from this guy at the airport, it became clear to me what their model is, okay? They are starting, and this is just really happening, okay? Like this thing called... Uh, King Abdullah, whatever university. Actually, it's almost your last name. It's K A U S T. K King Abdullah something University for Science and Technology. Okay, it's opening up next year. It's a real thing, and they're bringing in. And this guy said very successfully. This American consultant said very successfully. A lot of real talent from around the world at the faculty level. Okay, <clears throat> these are the kinds of people who could attract capital, okay? Their research programs are, these are, these are faculty of a caliber that in science and technology traditionally attracts capital. If it were an American university, you'd see these research parks opening around. Okay, they're bringing them in, and they are educating all these Saudi students. The faculty are going to educate all these Saudi students, and the hope is that the capital will, this will be a place where you can amass uh, venture capital, and so the students will have jobs to step into. Now, that may not work, but the, it's the plan, and the it shows they've thought about it the faculty, more than I might the have expected. Teaching, it, 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 it's a not crazy plan. The faculty's teaching full-time, or are they... Yeah, totally. They're going to live there. Totally. This, and, and uh, I mean, these cities are going to have massive numbers of... Four, like, there's going to be a city that has a ton of Chinese, okay, sounds, and Saudis living with them. This and sounds then, like Jap J Japanese baseball, the... Uh, the real major leaguers stay in America, and the second string, when they're washed up, go to Japan. I, I, I don't think you're going to see top-flight American academics and European academics uh, go to Saudi Arabia. They're going to get the washed-up second string. Uh, what, well, well what, maybe. What, what graduates, promising grad student, is going to want to go to a country where he can't drink and can't go see Britney Spears and can't do all the things that worldwide boho yuppies like to do? Uh, why, Saudi Arabia is the last place on earth uh, that they would want to go. It's, it's, uh, I do not think that the police castle. are going to. I don't think the police are going to be raiding the homes of these academics looking for vodka, Mickey. First of all, um, secondly, you know, money talks. I admit that this this consultant had a vested interest in depicting this as a success because one thing he's doing, I think, is the recruiting. But anyway, let me just say that's their plan, and this is. One way I haven't yet phrased what I think is may well happen in Saudi Arabia is that there will be a decentralization of power, okay? And this would be part of that. I mean, traditionally, the money was with the royal family, right? This would be, if this works, the money is going to get distributed more widely, 
you know, because this will be merit-based. Who, who, who graduates from these graduate schools will be largely merit-based. So that's decentralizing. The Internet is already decentralizing power there because the government has less control over information. And this is why I'm guardedly optimistic and, and why really, again, one of the main things I worry about is fundamentalist backlash. Well, right. Why would you start a university in a place where if the if the... They had a popular vote. Fundamentalists would be pow- would be put in power who would execute you. Seems like not Look, the most it, promising place in the world to start. You a know, university. if you're teaching at a university and somebody walks up and says, you know, and you're making two hundred thousand a year, and somebody walks up and says, do you want to spend two years in Saudi Arabia making um, one point two million a year? It would get your attention, right? Well, two years. I don't know what the numbers are. Two years. But they've got this kind of money. Two years is not enough to found a research park on. You need a big institution where people are going to stay and do their life's work all their life. Not two years. Okay, you're right. Can I say one other thing? I'm sure they're working on solar power. Actually, they are. Big time. Really? Big time. I... No, because they want the solar fields to be in Saudi Arabia, and also probably it's good PR for them to wor- be working on oil alternatives. But this guy told me, I mean, the American told me, very big investment in solar power. Hmm. Were you joking? I was joking, but... Uh... No, they, they want to be, I mean, they got a lot of sun there. It's a resource, and, and they got a lot of land that has no, you know, no rivals to solar panels occupying it right now. Uh, good point. Uh, um, I think we're wrapping up here. But you had one more point. Yeah. yeah well, there's one thing. I mean, do you do you have a, a comment or you want to talk about any comments? Not particularly. I thought I thought I thought it was a good discussion. <laughs> uh, I thought, uh, I, I, you know, my fav- my favorite commenter would be Abu blah 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 al al Irlandi or whatever the guy's name is. Abu Nur al Irlandi. Although he seems to be at a bit of a twit, uh, he, you know, makes a big deal about the semantic distinction between Wahhabi and Salafist. Uh, well, he has a lot to say, and also he's willing to uh, to say things against the Saudi government as well as for it. Well, once again, you've endeared yourself to one of our commenters, and that's <laughs> my job. The chickens will come home to roost. That's as they my say. job is to foster your your precious little community, Bob. Yeah. The um, anyway. He's, but, but anyway, there is a distinction between Wahhabism and Salafism, and, and I think there's some merit to what he's saying, and certainly he's right that the people there don't use the term Wahhabism. I liked him. I just thought he was a bit of a twit. A twit, okay. Anyway, uh, no, that, that post of his is definitely worth reading. Um, I have, there are two commenters I would want to comment on. Um, one is East-West says Saudi Arabia's role in widely spreading Wahhabi Salafi hate doctrine in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and beyond can't seriously be denied. Uh, I think he owes it to us, or she, to bring to provide some evidence. If, if, if what he or she is saying is that now, and that's all I'm talking about, the last two, three years, now the Saudi government is spreading like, like jihadist no, ideology no, no, in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Bob, what? That, no, he's talking about before 9-11. I mean, are, are you saying that they never did it? Uh, no, no, I'm not saying they never they did They it. changed to 9-11, so I think you agree with this person. This person, oh, I, I, thought, I remember he was just saying, before 9-11, they, they obviously did it. Well, okay, then this is another case of somebody disagreeing with me by saying something that doesn't actually contradict anything I, I said. That, that's I what think that was the threat, but maybe I'm wrong. But uh, okay. you certainly didn't emphasize their pre-9-11 role in spreading their democracies when you were their hostage in Riyadh. Well, you know, if you had a sword this long... By the way, uh, I, I got my picture taken in front of the square where they do behead people. And I could send you that. Uh, but That would be good. You should post that. And, and, apparently, and apparently they beheaded uh, slightly over 100 last year. Um, this leads me to the comment from Wonderment. I also found his, meaning my, hesitance to pressure the Saudis and other nations on human rights reform surprising and disturbing. Bob needs to flesh that out a bit more. Do you think we should say that till next time? I mean, we're at 53 minutes. That's yes, a whole and, argument, and the right? Olympics are going to be... Bob is never the go-to guy for pressuring people on human rights. So if our, No, if it's our, a long-standing position of mine. If expect him to, uh, you're barking up the wrong tree. Right. Bob has... F- and, 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 and reserve judgment, reserve judgment on, before you condemn me for that, I think I have an ultimately liberal, progressive argument. Well, right, because all these, all these authoritarians are rubes who who have false consciousness, who don't realize that the historical forces they set in motion are ultimately going to topple them and bring human rights to their countries. But you're not condescending toward them. Or you are condescending toward them, but it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother me. Uh, Well, that's that's not the guidance I was looking for, so I will have to seek guidance elsewhere. 
Yeah, I don't know how to help you on that one, Mickey, and I feel bad that we're closing this with you still, you know, unsettled. That's okay, I'll blog about it. I, I have some thoughts uh, that I'm going to have to now try to make work independent of guidance from you, Bob. I feel that this has been our second consecutive very kind of eat-your-spinach dialogue, you know, high high in, well, arguably nutrition. That would be the, the best reading of it. And low in, you know, mirth. Zany antics. Antics. Do you have any dolls you'd like? Do you want to pull out the Ann Coulter doll and do with it as you will? Uh, that sounded great. <laughs> I have all sorts of props here, but um, but I don't know how to deploy them. Um, any Hollywood parties you want to talk about? Haven't been any. What's happened, Mickey? I was back east, if you remember. I used to go to those all the time. Oh, that's right. You were trying to, you were circling Princeton trying to get uh, a little FaceTime with my wife while I was, I was in Saudi Princeton. Arabia. I, I noticed that that little conspiracy failed. I drove by your house and, and thought of going in and chatting up your wife, Bob, but I knew that You would, chickened out at the last minute. I knew that would send you in a Darwinian rage. Yeah. And I, I would have Well, to... I brought back uh, I brought back veils from Saudi Arabia, so it's a little late now to, yeah. to get a shot at uh, her or my daughter's. She meeting. seems sort of receptive, Bob. You know? What? She seems sort of receptive to me stopping by and visiting, so. Nah. You're not going to. I'm not insecure on that front, Mickey. Nice try. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, but I did bring back I did bring back actual uh, nakabs, as they say. Um, well, uh, which, you know, we didn't get into the feminism. We could talk about that next time, too. Yeah. Okay. Because I did talk to more women about their condition, I'm, which some of them I'm, are definitely not that, happy about. That'll be, that'll be mirthful and, and antic-filled. Uh, yeah, nothing like a... Uh, yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Uh, so uh, next time we'll take up all these uh, issues, plus you will have several jokes prepared. I don't think so, but I have props. Okay, props. Okay. See you later. Okay. See you around. Bye. Bye.